Order. The next item of business today is the Members' Business Debate on Motion Number 10368 in the name of Angus Macdonald on Scotland's pollinator population. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. And I would be grateful if those members who wish to speak in this debate could press the request to speak buttons now, please. I call on Angus Macdonald to open the debate. Up to seven minutes, please, Mr Macdonald. Thank you, President Officer. I am uh, delighted to bring this debate to the Chamber this afternoon, uh, acknowledging the importance of pollinator species to the agricultural and horticultural industries uh, of Scotland. I would like to thank all the members who signed my motion and who support the cause, and also those who have stayed back to contribute to the debate. Uh, I realise it is all very hectic at the moment, so your time is appreciated. Uh, and I note also that, uh, sadly, the Cabinet Secretary and the Minister have been called away on other business. Uh, however, I am pleased to see Minister Rosanna Cunningham standing in, as I know she has taken a keen interest in the issue in the past, uh, in her previous life as an Environment Minister. So, as a member of the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee, I have become increasingly aware of the challenges Scotland's pollinators face. And at this point, can I thank uh, Craig, Mac Craig McAdam of the Invertebrate Conservation Trust, Bug Life, and Dr Maggie Keegan of the Scottish Wildlife Trust for their help and advice on this subject, which is more complex uh, the more you investigate it. Bug Life actively works to conserve the 40,000 invertebrate species in the UK, many of which are under threat as never before. Invertebrates from bees to beetles are vitally important to our planet and precious ecosystem. They underpin life on Earth and are therefore pivotal for our own survival. Insect pollinated crops rely on invertebrates to carry pollen from one flower to the other, uh, which produces crops for many fruits, nuts and seeds. Uh, bug life estimates that 84 per cent of EU crops rely on insect pollination. And to put it into perspective, it is estimated that every third mouthful of food consumed could be linked to pollination by bees. Uh, furthermore, insect pollinated fruits and vegetables grown in Scotland contribute significantly to our economy as well as our ecosystem. For example, the output value of vegetables in 2012 was valued at 102 million and fruits at 62 million. So, in addition, um, pollination provided to wildflowers and garden ornamentals make insect pollinators a vital component of our great biodiversity here in Scotland. Without pollinators, we could see a depletion of the foods we grow and the beauty we see in our wider countryside. Pollinator insects therefore ensure food security and the continuation of biodiversity across Scotland. However, the fragility of pollinator populations means that if they are not cared for, uh, they are easily damaged, diminished or become dysfunctional. So, For that reason, the decline in recent years of pollinator insects is not easily determined by a single driving force, but is caused by a multiplicity of factors, including environmental pressures, pests and diseases, such as reduction in wildflowers, the intensification of land use, fertilisation and harmful pesticides. And when it comes to uh, harmful pesticides, I unfortunately know a bit about that, uh, having used the organophosphate pesticide carbofurin on uh, my father's farm in the Western Isles when I was younger, uh, without proper protection and have paid the price health-wise. Uh, carbofurin has long since been banned, uh, but it's still used illegally uh, to kill birds of prey. However, it's neonicotinoids that seems to have the, the major impact on bees. So it's encouraging that a two-year ban has been imposed by the EU on neonics. Uh, however, ideally, a permanent, uh, a permanent ban in Scotland would, it is argued, help pollinators such as bees recover. Although, as the NFUS have highlighted in their briefing, uh, any ban should be based on realistic field-based research. Over the last 50 years, declines have been noted in many pollinator insects, but also in wildflowers across our countryside. Sustainability of the ecosystem, therefore, depends on maintaining pollinator populations and their habitats, which is why the EU's Integrated Pest Management Directive is so important. If we want our future generations to live in a Scotland buzzing with vitality, rich in foods and flowers, excuse the pun, um, then we must act now to preserve our landscapes and save our precious pollinators from extinction. In their manifesto, Get Britain Buzzing, Bug Life have outlined seven key principles that can guide our battle in rescuing our valued ecosystem and 27 actions that can arrest the alarming decline of the pollinator population. Principally, all pollinators should be valued for the service that they provide to Scotland. They should also be properly monitored and understood with a commitment to conserve and incorporate them in our green infrastructure. 
Now, unfortunately, I don't have time to list all the principles and actions that Bug Life are calling for, uh, but I would commend their Get Britain Buzzing manifesto uh, to you. Uh, and if you would like to contact me, I can provide you with a copy. Uh, good work has already been done, however. Um, I must congratulate the government on the excellent work they have done so far in undertaking initiatives to halt bees' decline over the last few years. Uh, the Scottish Government project, for example, investing up to £10 million in research to help identify the main threats to bees and other insect pollinators in 2009. Also, government-backed agri-environment schemes offering payments to farmers to help them maintain flower-rich areas for bees and other wildlife has also been an encouraging step forward in sustaining our pollinator habitat. Uh, recently, in June this year, the Scottish Parliament welcomed a new buzz uh, to this busy and hectic environment by installing two beehives um, on, on site, demonstrating in a very real and practical way the Scottish Parliament and Government has been committed to the nation's environment. And I'm sure other speakers will touch on our very own Parliament bees uh, during the debate. <laughs> no, no, not asking you to do it personally. Uh, although um, previous actions taken are commendable, we must do more to address this uh, very serious issue. Uh, I feel that the government actions prescribed must be made in conjunction uh, with our responsibility for local government, for example, to, to also facilitate initiatives in their own local authority areas that preserve Scottish wildlife and conserve our pollinator population. Uh, as MSP for Falkirk East, I have seen it first hand in my constituency, great work that can be undertaken by communities. The Jupiter Urban Wildlife Centre is a fantastic example of how wildlife can be preserved. What is unique about the centre is that it is an urban green space created from wasteland in the middle of industrial Grangemouth. Um, my constituents and NGOs have done an excellent job of constructing a reserve that both facilitates pollinator populations and encourages the community to invest in sustaining the pollinator habitat. Providing both educational and community resources, the Jupiter Wildlife Centre is an invaluable hub that we hope to see replicated in many other parts of Scotland. Uh, and can I add uh, that I very much look forward to visiting the Jupiter Wildlife Centre tomorrow morning uh, to officially open, along with local school children, the upgraded, the upgraded wildlife gardens at Jupiter. So in closing, President Officer, I'd encourage all my fellow MSPs to add their support to the bug life cause. Collapses in pollinator populations in China and parts of the United States have had big and visible impacts on their ecosystems and economies. But Scotland could lead the way in conservation and sustaining pollinators if we choose to act now and refuse to let the species struggle to survive. Our rich, beautiful and vast countryside and vegetation depends on us to actively work to protect it. I therefore hope all stakeholders, including scientists, farmers, regulators, beekeepers and environmental NGOs can all work together to ensure that Scottish farming and bees can coexist and ha have a sustainable future. Thank you. Many thanks. I have a number of requests to speak. If members could keep to their four minutes, I'll try to call everyone. I call Alison Johnston to be followed by Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I'm, I'm delighted the Parliament can still find time this week to discuss issues other than the referendum, because yes or no, we still all need to eat. Securing the health of our pollinator population really is at the foundation of our agriculture. The stark stats from the bug life briefing tell us that 84% of EU crops rely on insect pollinators. I think sometimes we can suffer from a focus on direct economic gain in this area, and we really must widen that. Many of the efforts I've seen uh, you know, look after the health of bees end up with a real focus on honeybees. Now, honeybees in the beekeeping, honey-producing economy is important, but we mustn't be tricked into thinking that keeping the honeybees healthy means that we'll be keeping our pollinator population at large healthy. The majority of pollination is by wild pollinators, such as bumblebees or the 250 other species of bee in the UK, flies, moths, wasps, beetles and butterflies. Yet many of our pollinators are in crisis, and that's no surprise when they've lost so much natural habitat in the last 60 years, including 97% of wildflower meadows. Pollination is one of those processes that's largely hidden from the public consciousness. The insects just get on with it, and we enjoy the fruits, flowers and food of, our, of their labour. But if we lose our pollinators, we might lose many of the plants they pollinate and the animals that rely on those plants. And the impact 
on the food chain would make sustaining the global human population massively challenging. The campaign, the campaign over the last few years to ban neonicotinoids, a highly damaging class of neurotoxins, was heartening but also infuriating. Millions of people joined organisations like the Scottish Wildlife Trust and others to protect our pollinators after scientific evidence showed the effect these nerve agents were having on pollinators. And the EU has put in place a temporary two-year ban for three of the most damaging insecticides. However, the big pesticide companies such as Bayer Crop Sciences and Syngenta are continuing in cynical attempts to pursue short-term profit at the expense of the health of the agricultural economy, indeed our own health. Presiding officer, the precautionary principle states, where there are threats of serious or irreversible damage, lack of full scientific certainty shall not be used as a reason for postponing cost-effective measures to prevent environmental degradation. As Friends of the Earth say, our pollinators are under serious assault from pesticides and intensive farming. We don't know what will happen after the two-year ban is up, but I urge the Cabinet Secretary, along with my colleague Angus MacDonald, to continue with the ban currently in place. I'd also welcome a response from the Government to the Bug Life Pollinator Manifesto, and I'd like to know what steps the Government will take to ensure that the planning process helps create and manage a network of pollinator habitats. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call Claudia Beamish to be followed by Christine Graham. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm very pleased to be able to take part in this debate on Scotland's pollinator population. And I would particularly like to thank Angus MacDonald for being able to secure the debate. And it, as, as um, the member said, it does depend on us. And I'd also like to thank SWT and Bug Life for their work, who are in the gallery today. Um, and, and I need to declare an interest as a species champion for the forester moth, which obviously is one of the many pollinators that we have in, in Scotland, which I visited the habitat of earlier this summer. Like many environmental causes that come before the Scottish Parliament, protecting biodiversity, specifically in this case pollinators, is something that enjoys, in my view, broad cross-party support and has certainly been very important to our committee, Rural Affairs and Climate Change and Environment. And I believe this has allowed us to move forward in some sense and address the concerning decline of pollinator numbers um, being highlighted today. Indeed, the Scottish Parliament, as Angus MacDonald has said, has taken steps in our own backyard, as it might be called, to promote the, the importance of pollinators with the new beehives. So in my own region of South Scotland, um, as there are in other parts of Scotland, there are a number of examples of reserves which play an important role in conserving pollinator populations. Falls of Clyde, Gary and Gill, and Upper, Upper, Upper Nethan Gorge all contain essential grassland areas which host many of Scotland's most productive pollinators, including various species of bees and butterflies and moths. These sorts of pollinator-friendly environments should act as prime examples of what communities and farmers can do to preserve pollinator numbers and improve biodiversity in general. And it also is happening in urban environments, as we've heard about the Jupiter project from Angus MacDonald. And we can all make a difference individually. And as MSPs, we can encourage our constituents to do so by planting in gardens, whatever size, and even in window boxes. Of course, we're all aware of the huge contribution that pollinators make in Scotland as a whole. And these insects play a central role in crop production, as Alison has already said, contributing roughly 43 million pounds to the economy, as well as helping Scotland's rich ecosystems flourish. However, as Angus MacDonald's motion for this debate has pointed out, this vital role is being put in danger. There are at the moment a decrease of as much as 65% in recent decades of pollinators, and I'm sure members will agree that this is something that we all have a responsibility to do something about. A large factor is, of course, the overuse of pesticides. Scottish Wildlife Trust especially have been campaigning for a moratorium on neonics so that the, the, so that the evidence base regarding their impact can be built up. This view has been taken on board, as we've heard, by the EU, which has recently imposed the two-year ban, but only on three types of neonicotinoid. Of course, pesticides are used for a reason, but it's important that they're used in a sustainable manner and only when required, rather than applying them to seeds before they are even planted. 
We must identify alternative methods of protecting crops from pests, including the Integrated Pest Management Plan, which is now an obligation on the EU member states. And perhaps the Minister will provide us of some details of how this obligation is being addressed by the Scottish Government. And if there are plans um, to actually have a ban in Scotland on neonicotinoids, um, because we risk the, the ban only being temporary in the EU uh, up to after 2015. We'd also, it would be very helpful also if the Minister could let us know what research is ongoing at the moment in Scotland. And we have heard from Angus Macdonald about research that the Scottish Government has already been doing. The Minister will be aware that Scottish Wildlife Trust have made suggestions of how to protect pollinators uh, within the common agricultural policy, including providing funds for farmers to provide ecosystem services. And these suggestions merit further consideration, I believe. I hope this debate will continue to draw attention to the importance of pollinators and the contribution they make to our economy, but the vibrant and wonderful colours and, and types that there are in Scotland. And, and I believe we must all contribute to making this situation better for their habitats. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call Christine Graham to be followed by Jamie McGregor. Uh, I congratulate the member on securing this debate. I remember his previous member's debate was on potatoes. This is on pollinators. He can move off the letter P and move on to something else. I will touch on the Parliament bees, not physically, of course. Uh, I have found out that the much-praised bees in our own hives here at Parliament are buckfast bees, which were known, Deputy uh, Presiding Officer, and I quote, for their calm temperament and productivity, perhaps not attributes associated with their political neighbours in this building. It is, of course, an unfortunate name, uh, perhaps, but linked to their breeding history and in no way predicates the taste of their honey, perhaps regrettably. And by the way, they may not remain so friendly. I understand that if they are within three miles of other bees, they will subsequently mate with a different species, being somewhat promiscuous and that some bee beekeepers recommend that the queen, not HRH, but the queen bee that is, is changed every year. Now here I am launching a plea and a criticism at one and the same time. So the big question is, why in the Scottish Parliament were the hives not populated by the indigenous and under threat Scottish black bee, which I am advised has wrongly been labeled aggressive. Not all things Scottish are aggressive. But I do have a proverbial, wait for it, bee in my bonnet, about this, as the Minister and the Cabinet Secretary for Rural Affairs know, because I've corresponded on this for some time on behalf of apiarists in my constituency, and in particular Joyce Jack of Peebles, Secretary of the New Battle Bees Association, my unofficial tutor in all things bee connected, who alerted me and educated me on the threat to this indigenous species from imports. Mrs. Jack may be in the gallery today, so I must be particularly careful with my facts. As in Blackadder, my beekeepers have a cunning plan, and a good one at that, especially after the decimation of hives a few years back through bad winters and springs. And the plan was to provide local beekeepers, after training, to increase the Scottish black bee population through breeding queens, this can be done, you learn something every day, by artificial insemination, though I think from correspondence with the Cabinet Secretary, Richard Lockhead, it is more coyly referred to as artificial instrumentation. It is done in other countries, and though it takes time, it's very cost-effective. Now, I do recognise the Black Bee Project in Colonsay, which is to be welcomed, but it needn't stop there. And I hope the Scottish Government will again consider this proposal again from individual beekeepers. In the meantime, apart from the requirement to ensure imported bees do not import viruses, councils and the public can be encouraged to plant spaces with bee-friendly wildflowers and cultivars, such, and I'm a gardener, as the buddleia and the sedum, to assist not just the honey and bumblebees, but of course the insect population at large, and honey is not the only product, of course. My tomato flowers are pollinated by the bees and the insects and give me fresh and tasty tomatoes. And the bird life in my garden thrives on the supply of fresh insect protein. Finally, and I am going to mention the referendum. Once the buckfast bees have outlived their stay or migrated, as they may to form another hive, 
Can we give the Scottish Black Bee a chance? September the 19th will do as a patriotic gesture. Thank you. Now I call Jamie McGregor to be followed by Liam MacArthur. Uh, thank you, Deputy Sergeant Officer. In every language under the sun and by every generation since time began, the importance of birds and bees has been uh, emphasised. And it's been echoed by poets, including Robbie Burns. And they, because they are the things that keep our humanity and our world going. Um, the role of pollinators to the economy and environment is vital and makes the decline of a broad variety of pollinators a matter of huge concern. And I'd like to congratulate Angus MacDonald on bringing um, such an important topic to the Parliament. I'm proud to declare that I'm a species champion for the marsh fritillary butterfly uh, that unfortunately has been declining for the past 150 years due to loss of habitat and parasites. This is only one of the many examples of pollinators whose existence is under severe threat. Pollinators such as honeybees and bumblebees play a key role in the majority of ecosystems, and they're essential for parts of our agricultural economy. The Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations estimate that over 100 crop species that provides 90% of all the food worldwide, 71 are animal pollinated. The number for Europe is even high, higher at 84%, valued at 12.6 billion per year. The production, production value of pollinator dependent crops is roughly five times higher than those crops that are not dependent on insects. And this only shows our reliance on pollinators, thus making the decline of these species a matter of huge concern. Governments should have a plan B. Whilst it is hard to accurately determine the precise economic benefit the pollinators provide, they have a very, very significant impact. Their role in commercial production of soft fruits, such as raspberries and blackberries, as well as oilseed rape, to mention just a few, uh, cannot be underestimated. And the trend in Scotland, unfortunately, is clear. The abundance of pollinators has gradually declined over the past 50 years. This has been especially in the case of bumblebees. Bumblebees are the only pollinator of potato flowers in the world. Scotland's potato crop is estimated to be worth 160 million, and the decline of a staggering 60% in the abundance of bumblebees must be very concerning for us. Other reasons for the decline involve the destruction and fragmentation of natural habitat. The e EU demands that all farmers set aside 5% of their land for greening, which falls under the first pillar of the common agricultural policy. It's important that a compromise is found that ensures that there is enough natural habitat for our pollinators, not only to survive, but to flourish, whilst ensuring the sustainability and successes of our agricultural production. The sources of decline are many and diverse, as well as differing, differing between the different species of pollinators. Other invasive species, such as parasitic mites, are in themselves a major threat to apiculture, but also spread a number of diseases. This has decimated honeybee colonies across the world, ranging from the Middle East and Japan to Europe and the US, where up to 85% of colonies have been wiped out due to mites or diseases spread by them. It's important to find the balance between the environmental and the commercial interests, but it's clear that we must take urgent action to avoid widespread environmental and economic implications. Um, uh, we must take heed of this warning, which is like the canary in the coal mine. Um, and um, on a note of perhaps slight optimism, my local pharmacist told me that there's been an explosion of stings by bees and wasps this summer. And so remember, if you get stung, be thankful for small mercies and also small things. Um, I'd like to conclude with a quote um, uh, from the United Nations Environment Programme. The health and well-being of pollinating insects are crucial to life, be it in sustaining natural habitats or contributing to local and global economies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr McGregor. It makes me feel better about the sting I got at the weekend. I now call Liam MacArthur to be followed by Rob Gibson. Thank you very much, Deputy President Officer. Can I start, like others, in uh, thanking Bug Life uh, Scotland, Scottish Wildlife Trust, but in particular Angus MacDonald, uh, for playing the invaluable role of keeping this issue uh, on the parliamentary uh, agenda. This is a role performed, I recall, in the previous parliament 
uh, by my uh, good friend and uh, former fellow Highlands and Islands MSP Peter Peacock, who seemed to delight uh, in standing up for invertebrates, as he said. Uh, he almost became his parts, his spokesman uh, for the birds and the bees, and un I think would have unequivocally welcomed the beehives in the parliamentary complex, although probably drawn the line uh, at uh, volunteering for inv in artificially inseminating uh, any of them. Uh, the importance of, of bumblebees, honeybees and other pollinating insects. I recall um, in the debate we had in 2009 on this issue uh, some figures that were fairly striking and evidence of this. 84% of EU crops uh, are pollinated by insects. 80% of wildflowers depend on insect pollination. And I, I think rather more even than Angus MacDonald suggested that uh, two out of every three mouthfuls of food we eat come from plants pollinated by all pollinating uh, insects. So the fact that numbers have dropped so dramatically, I think the figures are around 60% in terms of the bumblebee population over the last uh, 50 years matters a great deal. It matters economically. Uh, as others have indicated. It matters environmentally, as Alison Johnson reminded us, in terms of maintaining our biodiversity. It should, therefore, matter politically. And I think if further persuasion was needed, uh, SWT point to a YouGov poll uh, suggesting that around 85% of people put this right at the top of the environmental uh, agenda. So decline in bee numbers isn't a problem unique to Scotland or indeed the UK. It appears to be a worldwide phenomenon and um, I think the, the reasons for it are complex, covering the, the loss of floral diversity and, and nesting habitat, climate change, invasive non-native species, uh, intensification of, of, uh, of farming practices and also the impacts of, of pesticides. And unlike others, I think I welcome the, the, the ban on uh, neonics over the next two years. I know there's an argument for uh, going further with that. Uh, but in the meantime, I think the rules set out on sustainable use of pesticides and indeed of the, uh, the, the guidance on integrated pest management are welcome uh, steps forward. And I think also provide perhaps an opportunity to look at, uh, th uh, through research, uh, alternatives uh, to these practices. I think I'd uh, also uh, be interested to know um, uh, from the Minister uh, what through the new CAP rules might be achieved through the, uh, the greening requirements and through agri-environment schemes that she could perhaps ask a colleague uh, to write to us in due course. But in the interest of, of research, I think this is somewhere where Scotland probably can punch above its weight through the Morden and John James Hutton Institute. Understand that Newcastle University is already uh, looking at ways of, of um, bringing together natural toxin from spider venom with plant protein to produce an insect-specific pesticide. So I think there is excellent research uh, going on there. I was struck by a couple of initiatives SWT refer to the flying flock of sheep and herd of cattle used to lightly graze trust reserves to help maintain habitat, conjuring up all sorts of in, uh, uh, images but no sign yet of the flying litter of pigs. Gardening for wildlife, demonstrating that we all have a role to play in this. And I think, with all due modesty, I can claim some uh, success given the rampant explosion of nettles, thistles and other assorted plants in the land around my own house, uh, creating a number of no-go zones for humans, but a, a haven for bees. Indeed, Orkney is fortunate to be one of the few parts of the UK that still can lay claim uh, to having great yellow bumblebees in some numbers. But the bee populations in Orkney are under threat in the case of the honeybee from the threat of the Varroa mite. Uh, the Minister from our previous role will know uh, that the opportunity to have statutory infected area status uh, protection on the islands has been lifted. Uh, but I still think the Pentland Firth is an ideal barrier for a variety of animal and insect diseases. Uh, it will not be easy, um, I, I think, but putting in place even a voluntary ban uh, on the import of hives and of bees uh, could make uh, the destruction caused by the varroa mite and other diseases less of a, a problem in the future. And I would hope she would encourage her colleagues to take that forward. So once again, in conclusion, can I congratulate Angus MacDonald uh, for bringing this debate uh, forward, for giving us a bit of a breather from matters constitutional. Let me finish uh, with a quote ascribed to Einstein um, that if the bees go, mankind will follow uh, within four years, which perhaps puts into perspective our deliberations on our constitutional future. Thank you very much indeed. Many thanks. And I now call Rob Gibson to be followed by Jane Baxter. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, Presiding Officer, there are other things to be said about uh, the current crisis on bees, uh, but I declare an interest as a member of the Soil Association, Slow Food Scotland and the Scottish Crofting Federation. But I'm very happy to thank Angus MacDonald, who deserves every credit for securing this timely debate. The decline in pollinators, bees, moths, butterflies, hoverflies and many other invertebrates has been around 
60%, perhaps more, and bumblebees alone have lost over 60% in the last 50 years, of which the black bee in Scotland is a bumblebee, not a hive bee. This cannot be repeated often enough, as uh, if we are to wake up to the multiple causes and seek long-lasting solutions to restore pollinator biodiversity. The causes are multifactorial. Hedges grubbed up in past times uh, have been robbed of wildflower margins, uh, blossoms and hawthorns and geans, and also nesting sites. Pollinator corridors were disrupted, and the impacts of climate change and agricultural intensification use uh, has intensified. Invasive non-native species and pesticides and bee diseases like Varroa have also taken their toll, as has been alluded to by other members. A fortnight ago, I met with Robin Ingalls, the secretary of the Ulrich and District Beekeepers Association in Caithness. He was dismayed by the arrival of Varroa mite in Halkert near Tharso. It's taken 20 years to spread across Europe, and I've been monitoring this disease for over 15 years as beekeepers from further south have rashly imported bees to the highlands from hives that were infected. Robin Ingalls stresses that the Scottish Government's bee health programme is very welcome. Also that free tests available from SASA, the Science and Advice for Scottish Agriculture organisation in Edinburgh, helps beekeepers plan and reduce the impact of this disease, which only one of the many that they encounter. The John O'Groat Journal reported the 25th of July that 2,000 varroa mites can kill a colony of 30,000 honeybees. So that's the seriousness of the problem. President Officer, the Racky Committee has discussed the threat to honeybees from neonicotinoids, which have decimated bumblebees and led to the EU directive placing a two-year ban on the treatment, including in oil seed rape. The evidence in international science suggests that integrated pest management plans are essential and an extended ban on neonicotinoids is essential. The UK guidance was skewed by the anti-EU stance of the then UK Agriculture Secretary Owen Patterson, who claimed that field trials would be needed to verify the EFSA ruling. However, mounting international evidence needs to be applied soon. Scottish Government's precautionary principle has been influenced by the NFUS and their call for field trials also. And, not, uh, the, and I note that the NFUS put in their briefing that, that they suggested that unrealistically high doses of plant protection products had been applied in lab tests. However, an article in the Guardian newspaper on the 7th of August on food self-sufficiency points out that yields of wheat and oilseed rape, for example, have flatlined since 1998. It's interesting to note that neonicotinoids were introduced in 1995. They do not seem to have helped the increase in the yield of oilseed rape. Indeed, in some areas, oilseed rape, like other cooking oils, are produced uh, without the use of neonicotinoids, such as by Robert McKenzie at Calice in Easter Ross for his award-winning Calice oil seed rape oil. The contrast between the need for integrated management plans to protect pollinators was never more urgent. The Scottish Government's moves in that direction are widely welcomed and the science applied so that farmers and the wider community can have peace of mind. NFUS Scotland has said that it would welcome further opportunity to work with stakeholders, including uh, scientists, regulators, beekeepers and environmental NGOs, in order to ensure that Scottish farming and bees can coexist in a sustainable manner. Uh, presiding officer, in ending the threat to bees uh, in Scotland, we need to promote and find the scientific research uh, as soon as possible in greater amounts in our outstanding colleges and institutes to solve the problem of pollinator decline. This debate is a wake-up call. Thank you. Thank you. Finally, I call Jane Baxter. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I would like to join my colleagues across the chamber in congratulating Angus MacDonald on securing this debate. I'd also like to congratulate Bug Life and the Scottish Wildlife Trust for their consistent work in highlighting the importance of the pollinator population to maintaining the biodiversity of not just our countryside, but our urban environments too. We have learned how vital pollinators such as bees, 
hoverflies and other insects are to our ecosystems and that they are an essential part of the food chain. The loss of pollinators and the potential impact on food supply for humans as well as wildlife is quite daunting and it's very easy to feel powerless in the face of such devastating statistics. Yes, we must take precautionary steps such as banning new neonicotinoids, as the EU has done for the next two years, but we must also have measures in place which will attempt to support habitats and rebuild pollinator populations. And what has been especially heartening to see amongst the worrying developments of the last few years and the decreasing pollinator population are the very simple, easy contributions every person can make to try to improve and increase the habitats of pollinators. Bug Life's campaign to get bitten buzzing is a great example of this, and I'm pleased to see the, it getting the recognition it deserves in today's debate. Biodiversity is an issue which this Parliament has considered before, and during my time on the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee, I welcomed the opportunity to participate in debates on this very topic. Looking back to my contributions then, I note that I highlighted the huge range of biodiversity in Fife and the excellent work being carried out by projects across the region, including at Loughor Meadows. There are, of course, many other projects across Miss Scotland and Fife which are helping to lead the fight back for our pollinator populations. Near Ceres in Fife is Fleece Falls Meadow Wildlife Reserve, which benefits from the wonderfully named Flying Flock of Sheep which the Scottish Wildlife Trust used to manage grasslands across Scotland through conservation grazing. But in mentioning bugs, bees and even sheep, it would be remiss of me not to mention the brown long-eared bat. As the proud species champion for this great wee creature, we need to remember how this and many other species are reliant upon a healthy population of pollinators and a diverse range of habitats. The Bat Conservation Trust have highlighted how important wildlife corridors can be for bats and other creatures by linking up different habitats across Scotland's landscape. Impressively, it's not just the environmental importance of pollinators which has been calculated. The Scottish Wildlife Trust has been able to quantify the economic in impact of pollinators to the economy and estimated it to be at least £43 million annually in Scotland alone. And it's not just our agriculture and food sector who are reliant upon having a diverse and healthy pollinator population. When you add in the importance of Scotland's landscape to our visitors, then the tourism sector would surely be considered too. We know the threat to our biodiversity from the loss of pollinators is one which crosses borders. So I'm pleased that the UK's Environmental Audit Committee has also strongly voiced its concerns about DEFRA's reservations over the EU Commission ban on neonicotinoid pesticides. I welcome the precautionary principle which has been followed by the EU on this matter and I'd be interested to hear from the Minister what the Scottish Government's view is of making this ban permanent once the EU temporary ban has lapsed. We only have to look to countries where the pollinator population has already collapsed to see how vital it is that we get this right and I support the principles outlined in Bug Life's manifesto. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now invite uh, Rosanna Cunningham to respond to the debate. Minister, in around seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and can I congratulate Angus Macdonald for securing this debate on Scotland's pollinators. Uh, I'm encouraged by the impressive level of cross-party support he obtained for the motion, uh, although that was the case the last time as well. Um, as members may know, my colleagues Paul Wheelhouse and Richard Lockhead are currently at different ends of the country making important announcements, so they turn to a former Environment Minister to step into the breach uh, today. Um, I was toying with some justice-related uh, bee puns, um, and the only thing I could come up with was the police uh, training crack bee squads in order to help them with their sting operations. I don't really know where that uh, fits in with the rest of uh, people's uh, um, uh, uh, puns on this particular uh, area. I actually responded to the motion in 2009, uh, uh, and uh, there was an equally informed discussion then as today. Um, I have been flicking through the uh, debate. Uh, there was also an equal number of puns as today. Uh, it's unavoidable. Uh, members will, however, forgive me if this time I have to refer some of their more specific questions to my colleagues, and I know that they will uh, come back on some issues. At the time of that debate, I highlighted the Scottish Government's intention to launch a 10-year honeybee health strategy. And the strategy has enhanced partnership working. It's what, halfway through uh, that process. It is helping us make steady progress 
towards the common goal of creating a sustainable and healthy population of honeybees in Scotland. And I'm encouraged by the strengthening of bee health initiatives and improved biosecurity in response to that honeybee health strategy. It's nonetheless important for beekeepers themselves to appreciate the significant role they play in ensuring disease management and control within their own apiaries. The economic importance of the honey market in Scotland is self-evident with an average annual value of around £9 million. Initiatives such as the Bee Farmers Association's Apprenticeship Scheme help strengthen this important industry by supporting younger people to take up the enterprise. And of course, we did have the Beekeeping Colonsay and Oronsay Order 2013, uh, an important step to ensuring that we have a reserve of black bee colonies which are free from disease and hybridisation threats. And I'm sure had Peter Peacock been in the chamber, he would have been wanting to welcome that uh, as well. As we've heard from a number of members, Angus MacDonald himself, Alison Johnson and others, uh, the issue, however, isn't just about honeybees. There are at least 1,500 species of insects that, that pollinate plants in the UK. Um, I, I will have to ask Jane Baxter to forgive me because I don't have specific lines on bats. Um, I'm, uh, I'm uh, indebted to her for bringing to my attention that they also play uh, a role in this and I will reprimand my officials uh, uh, for not at least having some reference to them uh, in my briefing. There is increasing evidence that wild bees and hoverflies are particularly important pollinators in Scotland. And the value of insect pollination services in Scotland is, as uh, Jane Baxter said, estimated at £43 million pounds per year. Uh, and that was acknowledged in the 2020 Challenge for Scotland's Biodiversity. We do share members' concerns about the declines in the number, diversity and geographical range of pollinators, especially those with more specialised habitat or forage needs. And we also recognise that we need to improve our understanding of the distribution, abundance and changes in pollinators in the countryside. And that's why we're contributing to a new UK-level initiative to design and test a national pollinator and pollination monitoring scheme. This will include an important people engagement element to the future monitoring effort, building on the contributions that can be made through citizen science. Scottish Government continues to support initiatives that improve our understanding of the range of factors affecting pollinators. For example, and this is in part answer to Claudia Beamish's request for information about research, we're investing £560,000 in that insect pollinators initiative. Uh, um, uh, this is a major research initiative, initiative in total of £10 million in nine projects over five years and it's led by the Biotechnology and Biological Sciences Research Council and draws together a number of different partners. The Insect Pollinators Initiative includes studies on managing bee and other insect pollinator diseases, understanding the impact of land use changes on pollinators, understanding the ecology and conservation of urban bees and pollinator efficiency. A number of members have mentioned, as I would have expected, the problem of neonicotinoids or neonics. Scottish Government will scrutinise emerging research evidence relating to the effects of neonic use and continues to support advisory work by Scotland's Rural College that informs farmers on the safe use of pesticide products and alternatives to pesticides. Our activity is, of course, much broader than simply evidence gathering. There's much that we do already know, and there's a lot that we can uh, and are already doing to help pollinators in Scotland. And this includes maintaining and re-establishing wildflower-rich grasslands and pasture. In the next Scotland Rural Development Programme, pollinators will continue to be one of the beneficiaries in the arable uh, options. That, that might not uh, answer the very specific question that Liam MacArthur asked, uh, but I will ask my colleagues to come back to him uh, on, uh, 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 on anything uh, further. Appropriate management of our hedgerows and road edges by local authorities and land managers is also important, uh, ensuring that the wildflowers along these are allowed to flourish during the main flowering period between March and September. And in the green spaces and urban areas, many of us ourselves can make our own contribution by planting pollinator-friendly plants in our gardens. And it's important that these span the seasons from the early flowering bluebells to summertime to the late flowering honeysuckle 
lavender or sunflower plants. And I want to uh, restate something that I said in the 2009 debate, which is that actually maintaining or allowing some wild areas in uh, uh, urban gardens is an enormous help in this regard. It is an excuse to be a lazy gardener, uh, and I don't know that people need excuses. So we need to build on successful initiatives such as the Bumblebee Conservation Trust Bees for Everyone project, supported by the Heritage Lottery Fund uh, and Scottish Natural Heritage. We recognise the range of activity required to enhance Im and improve pollinator populations, and we're working with SNH uh, to produce towards the end of the year a pollinator strategy that will help consolidate the partnership and collaboration effort already uh, in place. And the principles of the Bug Life Manifesto will be taken forward through that particular strategy. It will frame the future surveillance and monitoring needs and the crucial research required to help improve our understanding of the complexities. And £100,000 has gone in as a contribution to that uh, scheme. So again, that's another uh, aspect of the spend. I, I do thank members for their contributions today uh, on the importance of Scotland's pollinators. Raising awareness of the issues and the steps we can all take to help pollinators is important. Uh, I hope it's not another five years before there's a, another debate on bees in the Parliament. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Minister. And that concludes Angus Macdonald's debate on Scotland's pollinator population. I now suspend this meeting of Parliament until 2.30pm.